the most important trend is the rate at which population is growing in Africa. So global population is expected to reach almost about 10 billion by 2050. About 60% of that growth is going to happen in Africa. So Africa's share of global population is going to be increasing from about 16% today to about 22% by 2050. And it may and also could potentially quadruple by the turn of the century, which means Africa is going to have a significant impact on global affairs, on the global economy, and also in its food system. So one of my key messages is that the rate at which demographic is changing implies that African affairs will no longer be the preserve for Africans, but will increasingly be a global affair because of the impact that Africans will be going to have. And that impact is going to be determined by young people on the continent who constitute over 60% of the population that is below the age of, the, over 60% of the population is below the age of 25. And those individuals, their values, their competencies, and the quality of training that they receive will determine the impact that Africa is going to have on the rest of the, on the, the, rest of the globe. It's a mega trend, which means it has influence on other things. So, for example, when we talk about areas where population is growing, are also the areas that are more at risk of food insecurity. Africa is one area um, like that. And then you also think about the dynamics that a population growth is having in these regions. I talked about land scarcity. We often hear about land abundance in Africa, but the reality is about 90% of available arable land in Africa is concentrated in just nine countries, which means 45 countries on the continent are either land constrained or approaching the full extent of their land. So land is going to be a binding constraint because of population growth. And we've seen that in rural areas where young people are now waiting longer even to inherit land because their parents have increased life expectancy. And that is what is driving some of the migration that we're seeing out of rural areas into other regions of the world. And that is why I say we are now in a global society, so you can no longer say that this is an African problem. Because if Africa is going to constitute one fifth of the global population by 2050, and maybe um, based on the projections, maybe of nearly a quarter, a more than a quarter of global population, that is going to have an, a significant impact in the rest of the world. Food demand there will determine food prices elsewhere. And if those people do not get the opportunities that is needed, we are going to have these increased um, social unrest which affects everyone. So, so I, I personally believe that uh, the human capital development is an important part. So one of the key things that I talked about in my, in my presentation is that we need two key pillars. The first pillar will have to be providing opportunities to expand employment opportunities, which is um, promoting broad-based agricultural productivity growth. But the second pillar is going to be the human capital development. At the rate at which we are now, if Africa's population is going to double by 2050, it means that we need to double the services, education, the health, and everything, just to maintain current levels, which is already low. So that is, that, that is a challenge. Another part, too, is, uh, but, but I believe that these dynamics, the, the megatrend population growth, between now and 2050, even if Africans, the current generation, decide they're just going to have one or two children, we're still going to be able to hit close to those projections. But between 2050 and 2100, the end of the century, there is room to be able to shape that. One example that I gave was girls' education. If you educate girls, let's say every, every African girl is afforded to go to um, secondary school. If they go to secondary school, those that go to secondary school are going to delay marriage. They are going to delay when they have a child. If every, if every girl has a child at the age of 15, in 60 years, you have four generations. 
If you're able to increase it to about 20, you divide that. In every 60, in, in every 60 years, you're going to have three generations. So we at least be able to reduce that population by a quarter. How do you do that? By educating girls. You think that's that's it, it, providing them with secondary education, and then but we, the sorry, evidence. Take the, me, the, give me that second step. There's one step missing, logically missing. Why does it, just mm -hmm. explain to me how do you feel that educating girls actually brings that effect? Because there's something in the argumentation. Is because the the, the 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 education, those if they are going to go to school, then they are not going to get in marriage early. It is the early marriage that makes them have children early, right? But if they go to school too, they do not only learn skills to participate in the labor force, but they also learn, um, uh, they gain economic empowerment. That gives them more power and control over their family decisions. Most women do not want to have the number of children that they already have. But they don't have the means to be able to stop it from happening. Okay. So the education helps them to reduce it. Most educated women delay when to get married. They delay when they have children, and they have fewer children, and they're able to invest more in their children, and eventually able to pass it on, to pass that gains even to their own children in the long term. Part of what we are experiencing now is there is a fundamental shift in our societies across um, Africa. And part of that shift threatens people, especially men. Right. For a long time, traditionally, with um, African men and a number of, I would say, men in several cultures, have built their manhood around they are the provider, they are the protector, and then, as a result, they should have the final say. We have a situation where that is changing, where women are getting to labor force. Women are also um, earning income. And we also have in the situations where the insecurities that require a man to protect a woman, uh, we are doing away with that. And that is leaving a lot of men also with an identity crisis because that is where they derive their manhood from. So there is a lot of education that needs to happen so far as the men are also concerned. As to your role as a provider may not necessarily have to be you writing the check. It may be you providing that emotional support to your wife. Because nowadays, most people marry because of companionship. That role of I'm marrying you so that you provide for me is no much of a case. But a lack of understanding of what the role of a man is in our society, or what makes a person a man, is what is doing that. And we have not fundamentally addressed that. And then you talk about the issue of gender um, equality, right? I believe it's not a, the, the equality itself is not the way to go. It's about equity. And sometimes we miss those two words, right? The man and the woman are not equal, but we need to promote equitable arrangement, which will allow each and every one of them to be able to fulfill their promise based on their capabilities. That is the equity. So the equity means that if we are recruiting in the army, we don't say that, okay, we are all equal, so all of us have to do 20 push-ups in order to be able to qualify. You disadvantage the woman. But the equity implies that you look at, okay, the man might be inherently strong, maybe more muscular, so he can do 30, but a woman will do 20, and he will still qualify to be able to go. We provide an access to both of them to be able to fulfill that, right? And framing the argument along equity lines makes it more easier for men to accept it than the equality line. So there is kind of some education that needs to be done on both, on both ends. I would say young mothers have a role to play in shaping that. But of course, the frame of young mothers is shaped by their cultural context and be shaped by their own reality. Some of them live in male-dominated societies and have come to accept it as a given. When you have a situation where 
a woman is educated and they know what they are supposed to do. Um, they know what they are capable of doing and they are given the resources. They are better able to guide their young men to respect other women, to give other women the due, what is due them and not abuse them. But if the woman himself, herself is going through a process or he has already subscribed to the male dominate, um, dominated cultures, do you think that is a reality? And may not be empowered to educate their um, young women. But I believe the family unit is going to play an important role when it comes to that kind of education. Who do you need to message at? So you don't message, we've been talking about mm -hmm. the women, the women, you know some people say it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we said well, it's the men. Then other people said, well, it's only not only men. Mm -hmm. Now I suggested it's the young mothers because, and because then they have impact on the little boys. Mm -hmm. But maybe they are young mothers of 14, 15 years age. Age and actually, who has to say in the household is the mother-in-law. Yeah, I, I, th I, th I think it has to occur at multiple levels, not just one particular group. I believe that the education of the young girls, you are able to get a generational shift, right? But you also need to educate the older group and get them to understand what these changes are. They are not necessarily opposed to the changes; they are opposed to the results that could potentially come out of those changes. Right, because whatever exists, the status quo, people benefit from that. Changing the status quo will mean a loss to people. And that is where the tension comes from. And typically, um, those of us in development, things are very clear, right? We see, we, see, we see things from a very clear glass. We think everything, everything is okay. Um, but we fail to acknowledge some of the losses that other people might feel because of our actions. Mm. They fear but the devil that they don't know, they prefer the devil that they have. Yes, yeah. yes. So, first of all, we need to recognize that those losses are real. Right, those losses are real. And the question, how do we compensate for those losses? You can talk about the same of uh, youth empowerment, right? We don't want to give young people voices. But young people cannot come in the, in the forum of adults and talk anyhow. You are not going to listen to them. So in as much as we want to give young people voices, we also have to train those young people to respect their cultures and convey their message in a way that the adults will listen to them. Why do you think population growth is only slowly re-emerging as a subject of development cooperation? Population growth is emerging as, a, as an important topic. I don't, I don't think it, it, it actually went away. It has always been um, a, a topic that has been, that have generated a lot of interest. I think part of what is happening now is the projected shifts that we are seeing around the world. Like I talked about initially, about what we, the, the, the shifts about the population growth in Africa. That is a fundamental shift. Uh, so it generally, um, ignite some interest as to there's an area where you already have an issues of food, uh, food insecurity. So if population growth is going to come, uh, um, it's going to, its populations are growing rapidly, it means it's, the conditions could, could, could be worse and that is troubling because can you, can you imagine almost about 40% of the world's population living in abject poverty? That could potentially be what could happen if we are not able to put measures in place to, to address that, right? But I also want to retreat the fact that there are measures that can be taken to address these things. and need not necessarily, uh, th those projections, some of them may happen now, but it, we do not necessarily uh, need to see them as inevitable. They may not. When we talk about uh, population growth is high in Africa, right? But we do know that birth rates is declining in Africa. Fertility rates are declining. They are not, they, but they are not declining as fast as they are doing in Asia, in Europe, and in the, and in the, in, in the Americas. Right. It has declined from about 6 
no, the 605 light bulbs in the 70s to about four on the continent of Africa. There are certain places like Niger that is a little bit higher, but it's, they, are, they are declining. They are just not declining as fast as we would like it to be. 